Okay. Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to BC214, our course on developing the human spirit. Can somebody please pray, and we will start. Father God, we thank you for this day. Thank you for this time. You help us, you guide us by your Holy Spirit. You strengthen our inner man, God. You develop our spirit in, in our spirit, God. We surrender everything into your hand, God. Today's class into your hand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay. So um, I hope Chira will join the class back. For some reason, when it, the recording starts, sometimes it pushes somebody off. I'm not sure why that happens. All right. Let's... Um, Continue from where we stopped last week. Uh, we were talking about analogies of the human spirit. What the um, sorry, I'm just scrolling through the notes here. Uh, lesson number four: What the human spirit looks like. So these are pictures or um, uh, representations of the human spirit, and uh, and we're just going to look at them quickly today. So we understand, we gain some insight about what our spirit is like. Right? So in scripture, the heart or the spirit is referred to as the house. As a house. So we have to think, my spirit is like a house. So we see some examples in Genesis 4 verse 7. You know, this is very beginning. Uh, Cain and Abel, uh, Cain has, uh, you know, is angry with his brother, Abel. Uh, so if you look at Genesis 4 and verse 7, God, is, God tells Cain, uh, so, so Cain is angry, and then uh, he says in verse 7, God, the, God speaks to Cain and says, If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Right? So this is just before Cain goes and kills Abel. He's very angry. And then God is telling Cain, I want you to know something. Sin is at your door. Uh, which door? It is not not like the physical house door, right? But it's the door of his heart. Sin is there, but you must dominate it. You must rule over it. Right? So we see one picture there. Matthew 12, uh, another picture of the heart or the spirit like a house. Right? Uh, Jesus is uh, talking about uh, deliverance and casting out demons here. In Matthew 12, 29, he says, How can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then he will plunder his house. And then verses 43 to 45, somebody could read it. Matthew chapter 12, verse 43 to 45. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places, seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept and put it put in order. Uh, then he goes and takes with him se seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it also be with this wicked generation. So, Jesus is talking about deliverance. Casting out of evil spirits. And notice he's, verse 44, the spirit is saying, I will return to my house. House. Who's not? The spirit is claiming ownership. Actually, it's a human being, right? It's been cast out of the person. 
when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, a human being, going out. But the spirit is saying, I go back to my house. And uh, he's saying the house is cleaned up, empty, it's nicely kept. He says, he brings four more guests, seven more guests come from the more wicked they come and dwell. But notice how Christian spirits are treating this human person as a whole. And then you look at Revelation, uh, you know, First Corinthians three sixteen, and then you go to Revelation. You look at First Corinthians three sixteen. Paul is writing to believers now, and you know the scripture, but and we can read it, First Corinthians three sixteen. 1 Corinthians 3.16 Don't you know that you yourself are the God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? Revelation 3 verse 20. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. It can inhabit, somebody can stay there. It's actually meant for God. Meant for the Holy. It is also a place of communion. Because Jesus said, I will come and I will dine. I will have food with you. I will commune with you. So the house, the spirit, is a dwelling place. So correctly, the spirit is supposed to be a dwelling place of God. God should come and dwell there. And it should be a place where we commune with God. In the spirit. You understand it, right? Like house. Think about a house. You'll invite people. Come, please come. Uh, talk. Have fellowship. To talk to people. So that's your spirit. But if that's not a place where God is dwelling, then sin is trying to enter. Unclean spirits are trying to come. They want to come in. Well, right? So your spirit is a thing. So we just talk from a believer's perspective. From a believer's perspective, our spirit is where God dwells. Our, I have to keep it clean. I have to keep it holy. Don't let any evil thing come in there. Right? No jealousy, no uh, hatred, anger, bitterness. Don't let anything evil come. So you can think of all these, like, you know, if you have a house full of cockroaches and dirt and everything, Lord Jesus comes. What is all these cockroaches <laughs> running in your house? What is it? Keep your house clean. Sorry, Lord, that I have little bitterness to that person. Lord, I have little anger to that person. Please forgive me. No, 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 clean, clean, clean. God wants to come and dwell here. Don't let all these things come. And it's a place when you commune with God. You know, you can have fellowship of God in your spirit. So that is one picture. Second picture. Lamp. Okay. Let's read that. Proverbs 20, 27, and then Psalm 18. Right? Proverbs. 
verse 20 and verse 27 the spirit of a man is the lamb of the lord searching all the inner deeps of the, his heart the lamp of the law so and let's read psalm 18 28 we'll read that put that two together psalm 18 28 for you will light my lamp the lord my god will enlighten my darkness the spirit of man is the lamp David said, you will light my lamp. So, our spirit is like a lamp and God will light it. And God uses it to search us. So, the lamp, we think about lamp. Of course, we know if the lamp is lit, it will give light. And if you have light, it gives you visibility. You can see where you go, how to take your path. So first, if you think about that, the spirit of man being a lamp, which God lights, it tells us that God gives us light, meaning revelation, guidance, instruction that we need in our spirits. Okay, God will light my lamp. So when I need light, when I need guidance, when I need revelation, where will it come? It will come in my spirit. It will come in your spirit. God will give you light there. Okay. So when you say God will light my lamp, you can, ima you can imagine like this. Suppose you're saying, oh God, I need your guidance. Where will it come? It'll, like, a, for example, a word comes into your spirit. That is God lighting your lamp. He's giving you guidance there. Okay, now you do like this. Right? So the Lord will light my lamp. But Proverbs also says that God uses it to search me. So not only God gives me guidance and gives us revelation and gives us instruction there, but he also searches us. Really wants to look at really looks there. Searches us. Like you know, Thomas said. Search me, O oh God, as all my hearts. What's really inside? And so God searches. So God really wants to. That's where He's what's in there. So, lamp speaks of Holy Spirit. One, it speaks of the fact that God gives us light, He gives us instruction, revelation, all of that in our spirit. Second, it speaks us of, speaks also of God using our spirit to really search us, know what's in us. Another picture, Matthew 12, is a place of deposit. Like you know, in today's language, we'll say bank. Put in a bank, you deposit there, then you take out, you can withdraw. So it's like a place of deposit. But the, of course, you know, in, in Bible times, they didn't use that language of a bank. But uh, Matthew 12, 34, 35, you see Jesus talking about it as a place of treasure. Let's read it. Somebody could read it. Matthew 12, 34, 35. Chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, verse 34, verse 35. Brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man, out of good treasure of his heart, brings forth good things. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure, bring forth evil things. Now, he's talking about the heart. 
And then with reference to the heart, he's talking about what treasure you have or what you have deposited in your heart. If in your heart there is good deposit, you bring out good things. If in your heart you have evil or bad deposit, you bring out bad deposit. So heart is a place of deposit. What you're putting inside you will then come out in your life, both in words and your experience. So what the food do that? So heart is you want that because it's like a storage place, deposit, place where you store. It's a treasure. Usually, treasure means something valuable you put in the bank, but here you're putting in your heart. What you put there, we come out together. So, we must intentionally put good things there, put the word of God there, and that's what we'll do. We can bring it. Uh, Proverbs 4 uses a different picture. It talks about the heart as a spring. That means a place where some things flow out. Okay. Proverbs 4, verse 23. 23. 22. Yeah, let's see verse 22, 23. Uh, my son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. For they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all diligence for out of it spring the issues of life. So, God is saying, in verse 21, keep my words in your heart. Verse 23, guard your heart because from it spring the issues of life. That means from spring comes out. From it comes the issues of life, the forces that shape your life. So the heart is like a spring, the place where something comes out from. The source says, put my word in your heart and protect your heart because from there the forces are shaping your life. So, this is now something that what happens in the life of If you keep your heart clean, if you put your heart, the people, the God's word in your heart, it's full of God, full of His. Presence, the spirit, but then it's, it's the word, God's presence, and God's power that's going to shape you. That's what will come out of it into your life. Possibly come out. Another picture is that of the womb, place where conception takes place and from which we give birth. John 7. Verses 37 and 39. So Jesus is talking about the work of the Spirit, but notice what he says about the Spirit. John 7. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not at given, because Jesus was not at glorified. So here Jesus is talking about the work of the Holy Spirit. And then he says, and I'm just focusing on one point here, he says, He who believes, verse 38, he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So that when you look at the Greek word, heart, it is translated heart. One of the meanings of that word is the womb. Out of your womb, 
will come. Okay, this thing will spring out. Now here he's talking about the flow of rivers of living water, which is very much like a spring. But what I found very interesting was the the Greek word, like a womb, the place where you are giving birth to something. So uh, some versions will say, out of his innermost being. King James, I think, says, out of his belly or stomach. Yeah. Will come. Out of your belly will flow. Out of your innermost being, out of that place where it's like a womb, the conception takes place and a child is born. That's the heart. So we didn't think about that. That my spirit is the place where I give birth to the things of God. And the Holy Spirit Himself is being released from my spirit, out of my enemies, the presence of the power of the Holy Spirit. So, uh, if you think about that picture of the heart being a womb, it means that's where God, conception takes place. God gives you ideas, He gives you vision. And then, as that vision grows in you, in your heart, at, at a right time, God will enable you to release it on the least that wish on the earth. Okay? A few more things. Ground. That means it's like uh, land, farm land. We know this. Matthew 13, 19. Like a soil or the place where you sow the seed. Matthew 13. Matthew 13, 19. 19. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the big one comes and snatches away what was shown in his heart. This is he who received seed by the wayside. So, seed that was sown in his heart. So, farmers going to sow seed, this seed is sowing seed on the ground. The heart is like a ground. Okay. Uh, the condition of the heart will then determine what happens with the seed. Okay. So God's word is seed, it is sown in our hearts. Our heart is a ground. That means we can intentionally sow seed and receive harvests. Right? Like the farmer, he wants a harvest, whatever of whatever crop he's growing. What does he do? He sows the seed of that crop, and then at the right time he receives the harvest. So you and I can sow the seed, God's word, into our hearts, and then receive the hearts. And so we intentionally understand. This is how the Spirit is. If I sow the seed, of God, you take the scriptures, you sow it into your heart, you begin to reap uh, that kind of harvest. Two more things. Um, tablets. Uh, uh, places where you write something. Second Corinthians 3, 3. Somebody could read that. Second Corinthians three verse three. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink but with spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone but on tablets of human hearts. The heart is like a place where you write. So he compares it to a letter and a tablet. That means we can actually, so basically Paul in this context, he's saying, by the Holy Spirit, I have written into your heart the truth of God, the work of God has taken place in their heart. So the human spirit is like that. In the context of ministry, when you're ministering to people, you are actually writing into their hearts. You know, um, you're, you're, and, and these things will remain in their lives uh, for, for, for the rest of their lives, the truth that you put into their hearts, um, uh, whatever you, 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 you impart to them in the spirit, it will remain with them for the rest of their lives. So Paul is telling, uh, I've been able to write into your heart by the Holy Spirit. 
Last one, vessel, like a container to contain something, a vessel. Second Timothy 2.21. Somebody could read it. Timothy 2 verse 21. If a man cleanses himself from the latter, he will be an instrument for noble purpose, made wholly useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. He will be a vessel for honor. Translation is put instrument. Uh, but we see here and other places that we are vessels, right? So we we do sing the song, you know, you are the potter, I am the clay, I am a vessel. So vessel, vessel is a container. Uh, here Paul is having the picture of, uh, you know, very nice costly vessels made of gold and silver. And then you have regular vessels, you know, earthenware. So he's saying, see, uh, earthenware are uh, vessels, but with these, these, these very vessels that are gold and silver, um, they're kept uh, for special use, noble, you know, very special use. Master's very proud, you know, very special use. So he says, if we purify ourselves, we'll be like that, vessels that God can use. Right? The idea is that. Uh, we become instruments of God ministering something to the people. So we contain, we carry something, and through us, God is giving to it to the people. So vessels uh, that God can use or instruments God can use. I want to ask one question. What is the difference between a vessel and us? So we are like vessels. Our spirit is like vessels. What is one difference that you can think of? Ah, ah. That is true. That is true. So they are uh, they are uh, inanimate. We are human. And but what is that? Mean? So that what resulting is what? Uh, normal literal vessels, they can't uh, uh, fill or they can't empty themselves by our own. But with us, it's in our hands that we can fill ourselves or we can empty ourselves by our own. True. True. So the point that what I mean, essentially you said that, but what I was looking for is vessels, uh, objects, they don't have a will. Whereas we have a will, free will. This is kind of what you said. You said it's in different words. So that's the difference. So when we say, thou art the potter, I am the clay, it is true in one sense. God is shaping us and all that. But remember, there is also a big difference. The clay that is sitting on the wheel, potter is doing, the clay can't say, I don't want to be shaped. Stop. <laughs> Stop your work now. But for us human beings, sometimes we can tell God, God, I don't want, I'm going, if you don't cooperate. Right? So that is a big difference. Uh, yes, God is shaping us, God is molding us, but we are not inanimate things that, that you know, God will work in us to the extent of our cooperation. He needs our will to be aligned to us, but that's a big difference, right? Um, so, um, keep that in mind. So, what we've done now is we look at different pictures, right? and we have to think about so this is what the human spirit looks like. Right? Therefore, when we engage with God, when we engage with the things of God, understand, God, come in and Lord, I really want to fellowship with you. You're saying, Lord, I'm a house. My spirit is a house. Come and fellowship with me. Uh, when you take the word of God, put it into your heart, then you're saying your heart is a treasure. You want to put good treasure in. Your heart is a womb. You want to give birth to the things of God from your spirit. Your heart's good ground. You're putting seed there so that the seed can produce. 
You know, so you're intentionally using this revelation, you're understanding what the human spirit is. You're using it for developing your spirit. Then you realize your spirit is like a vessel. You say, Lord, fill me. I want more of you. Right? So the capacity, another, you know, another different, the capacity of the vessel, earth physical vessel is limited. The capacity of the human spirit is unlimited. Now, so some people say, how you can say, God, I want more of you? Because two things. God is infinite. Second, your spirit doesn't, doesn't have finite capacity. Your human spirit has infinite capacity. As much as you want. Your hunger and thirst, you want some more? Some more you can have. You can have some more. So it's not like, oh, I only, you can only, your spirit can only have so much. No, the human spirit, capacity, human spirit is limitless. So that's what we can pray and say, God, I want more of you. If you look at a vessel, uh, it's only so much. Human spirit? There's no. So Paul is saying, I want you to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. So how much strength do you want that you keep throwing, you keep asking for more? Right. So you understand this, this, this revelation of uh, the, the, the human spirit. It is like the soul. So uh, even if things around you are not going well, don't worry. You just keep your spirit clean and you fill your spirit with the things of God. Your life will change. Why? Because you know the forces that shape your life, they don't come from outside. They come from your heart. So out, around you can be all kinds of forces. It's okay, I'm not worried about that because what shapes my life is coming from my heart. It is not coming from there or here or there. So if I put the word of God in and I'm depending on the power of the Holy Spirit, that is what is going to shape my life and that is more powerful than any other force around me. Do you understand? This is how the human spirit is. You know? So intentionally you are working with this understanding, the revelation that we have in, in Scripture about the human spirit, with that revelation, you're building on it. Intentionally, you're building on it. Okay? So, let's introduce our next chapter, chapter 5. Any questions before we go to chapter 5? Sorry, what? Or what is the meaning of an yielded vessel? An yielded vessel is a surrendered vessel. That means I bring you, I recognize that as a vessel, I have a free will. And I bring my free will to be submitted to God. That means I'm going to be aligned to God and I'm going to be obedient to God. That's a yielded vessel. A vessel that is surrendered to God. So, yeah, Lord, whatever you say, I'll do, and I want to do what you want me to do. That's a yieldedness. Yeah, any question? Okay. Let's go to the lesson five. Let's get started. Um, we want to understand a little bit about the human spirit and its interactions with the spiritual realm. Right? So remember. One of the primary purposes of the spirit is to interact with the spiritual realm. The body helps us interact with the natural realm. Spirit interacts with the unseen realm, the spiritual realm. So we must understand that God works with and through, in and through the human spirit. So when God works with us, right? God can touch a spirit, soul, and body because he created a spirit, soul, and body. But normally, his first place of contact or interaction with us is in the spirit. God is spirit. He has created us as spirit beings. So his first point of interaction is spirit to spirit. Yes, he can touch our soul and yes, he can touch our body. Sometimes we feel the presence of God. Or sometimes, you know, the, 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 he, his presence is so overwhelming emotionally, you know, we respond, we feel joy, we cry, or all those things happening. Yeah, it's all good. But normally, the first point of interaction is with the spirit. Right? 
and uh, uh, so we need to learn to listen to the spirit the holy spirit working in our spirit um it is our spirit the spirit of man which is in him that knows or uh, things concerning us because that is the place that god gives revelation first revelation in our spirit the spirit of god is interacting he gives us revelation so it is in the spirit in your own human spirit that's the place where you're going to know the things your own thing things about yourself about your future about god's plan god's purpose so you always look learn to look into your spirit and i use this phrase look into your spirit what does that mean it means so what am i getting in my spirit so when you have to make this decision learn to look into your spirit i mean what is happening in my spirit do i feel peaceful about this yes we use our mind of course god has given us a mind to use use it but start with the spirit because your human spirit actually knows the things about you because that is the place where the spirit of god is interacting is giving revelation is giving instruction so first place to look at what is happening in this one to feel comfortable do i feel okay what should i do and, and then of course you process it with your mind your mind also processes other information that is good but start with your spirit let's look at one scripture then romans chapter 8 verse 14 to 16 Roman chapter 8 was 14 to 16 because those who are led by the spirit of god are sons of god for you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear but you received the spirit of sonship and by him we cry abba father the spirit himself testify with our spirit that we are god's children telling us a lot about what the holy spirit is doing in our spirit in verse 14 he is saying we are led by the spirit of god so this is one thing about the sons of god what about the children of god sons of god means god speaking god said god's children are led by the spirit so we must and led by the spirit. you let the holy spirit is leading the is your guide and as part of that verse 15 what does he do it is the holy spirit he is not the spirit of slavery so say so paul is making clear hey the holy spirit is not the spirit to makes us like slaves fearful of god it's not like that Holy Spirit is the spirit of adoption he make he's the one who's made us sons and daughters of God so he's the one who's helping us cry abba father that means because of the holy spirit in us we are adopted we are brought into God's family and we have the sense of belonging and we call God abba so holy spirit leads us Holy Spirit brings us into God's family. He enables us to relate to God as Father, Spirit of adoption, of sonship, Spirit of belonging. And you feel like a part of God's family. God is your Father. The relationship is. And verse sixteen, the Spirit bears witness with our. spirit that we are God's he bears witness the word bear witness it means he gives testimony like bearing witness giving testimony is bringing conviction that you are God's so where is the holy spirit bearing witness 
the spirit bears witness with our spirit. That means there's an interaction happening from the whole between the Holy Spirit and your human spirit. And in your spirit, he's bearing witness, he's testifying. He is giving the conviction that you are a child of God. Therefore, you can call Abba Father. And if he is giving that conviction in the spirit, then we can go back to verse 40 and say, Well, it's in the spirit that the Holy Spirit is going to lead me, going to guide me. So the Holy Spirit is giving witness with my spirit, he is also giving guidance with my spirit, with in my spirit. He's leading me in my spirit. Right? So the spirit bears with with our so we must train ourselves to learn to listen to the holy what is you know we can, we can use language like what is the holy spirit what what am i what is the leading in my spirit or what is the witness in my spirit what is the conviction in my spirit which the holy spirit is giving me that is the way he's going to lead me So you listen. In your learn to listen. Learn to listen. Right? Now there's a question. There is a question on the chat. Probably question, please. <laughs> Um, Pastor, when we are talking about uh, leading by uh, by the Spirit, and the Spirit bears witness, um, sometimes uh, maybe it happens that we feel in our spirit that we had to, we are led to do something, and uh, when you uh, do it, it doesn't turn out to be a positive outcome. So, but still we feel like oh, this is what we are led to do, uh, you know. Uh, so, in those kind of uh, scenarios, or how do we differentiate between it is our own, uh, you know, uh, our own thinking or our own leading, or it is actually genuinely led by the spirit? Do we take a step and we will come to know, or uh, is there any? Okay, I got your question. Good question. So, all of us have this problem or face this problem right to differentiate or distinguish between our soul and our own spirit soul and spirit are very close we refer to it as the inner man so sometimes we feel something or we have a thoughts we have an idea then the question is is it from my spirit or is it my own soul, my own mind, will, and emotion giving that feeling or that idea? How do we separate, distinguish? So this is where the Word of God comes in. So very quickly I mentioned Hebrews 4 and verse 12. We know that verse. It says, The Word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So the, whole, the word of God is the one that can pierce and distinguish soul and spirit. And it is a discerner of thoughts and intents that come from the heart. It is the one that can really discern, distinguish this thought, this inspiration intent is coming from my is what will discern. So the, this is the key. If we, and I'll just summarize it very quickly, if we fill ourselves with the Word of God, and uh, the, we will be able to distinguish, because the Word of God is what helps us distinguish between spirit and soul. So be established in the Word, ground yourself in the Word. So then the moment something comes up, there is the word in you which helps you distinguish spirit and soul. And it's the word in you that will discern, will clearly see thought and intent 
that is coming from the heart. You'll know, hey, this is Chuma, my own soul, my own, let it go. Okay, this is from the Holy Spirit. Right? So that's the first thing is uh, as we fill ourselves with the word. The second thing is a more practical thing, which is the more we learn to listen, uh, the more we become familiar. What is from the Holy Spirit? And what is from our own soul. So the way we do it is practice. Meaning, you get a get a thought, an idea, you do it, uh, and 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 you become more and more. Uh, it becomes more clear uh, what is from the spirit. So it's more practice. You, you you're getting used to it. It's like, example, you know, somebody calls you first time on the phone. Say, Hello, who is this? Maybe oh. second time, you're not sure. It's, uh, this person sounds like the other person, so you're not sure who. It, Oh, okay. Third time you recognize the voice. Oh, it is so and so. Right? You you come to recognize that voice. So you'll get to recognize the voice of the Lord, the, the voice of the Holy Spirit. So second example would be practice. Right? The more we learn to do this, uh, and I think uh, uh, along with that is just learning to subdue all other voices so that what comes in our spirit becomes the loudest. So the problem is, when there's a witness, and something God is saying, our mind is so busy. Super fast computers are uh, working, working, working. Lots of noise is coming. Lots of noise going on in our minds. And so what happens? It is drowning out the uh, voice of the, the witness of the spirit. Because all these things happen. So what happens? The Bible says, be still and know that I am God. So we calm down. So especially when I want to make important decisions, I go pray. Sometimes it takes one hour to ask to pray. Why calm down the mind? Mind, relax, be quiet for some time. Don't get busy. I need to calm down. Leave everything out. Don't don't touch the phone. Don't so many things. So many distractions. So many busy things. Come down. Be still. Then you can know. Be still and know. So best thing is to try to be still all the time. Be in a calm disposition all the time. Yes, a busy things. A lot of things are happening. Lots of things are going on. But you stay calm. Be still all the time. So then it makes it easy to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying. It will be still and no. Right? So these are just some practical things. So, but most important, it would be putting God's word in, right? And yeah, if we make mistakes, we learn from those mistakes and say, you know, I try to do better next time. I hope those few thoughts help, um, Ravli. Yes, Pastor. Thank you. Okay, let's close for today. It's already time. We'll continue this next week. Uh, try to practice these things that we've been learning, right, to develop our spirit. Somebody could pray and we'll close, please. Father, we thank you. And once again, we come to your presence, Lord. Thank you, Father, what we have learned through this subject, Lord. Help us to understand deeply, Lord Jesus, as what we learned. We could apply, Father, in our spirit, Lord Jesus. Thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Bless.